Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 750 Attraction Having read many magazines, Klein knew that the social life he wanted to enter had many balls, so he wasn't surprised by Walter's suggestion. He said with a nod, okay. With that said, he looked sideways at his valet, Richardson. Prepare the carriage. I'll be heading over to St. Samuel Cathedral. Klein vividly remembered that his main goal was to act as a devout believer of the Evernight goddess in order to get to know the corresponding clergyman and from there he would find a way to sneak into Chani's gate. Therefore, he planned to pray at the cathedral whenever he had the time to express his sincerity and get to know the members of the clergy. Yes, sir, Richardson answered politely. Before long, Klein boarded his rented luxurious four-wheeled carriage, decked out in a coat and a top hat. As he enjoyed the scenery on his journey, he sampled the black tea that was adorned with a slice of lemon. In fact, there was a tiny bar counter in the carriage, and in it, Butler Walter had specially prepared Golden Lanty, Winter Black Rand, and other distilled liquor, as well as all kinds of red and white wine that came from Antis. However, Klein wasn't someone who enjoyed drinking. As a Bayonder, he didn't like the feeling of being tipsy. It made him recall the feeling of losing control. Therefore, he used the excuse of him heading to the cathedral, so as to get his valet, Richardson, to prepare a pot of Marquis Black Tea. If it's possible, I would actually like a cup of sweet iced tea. It's something from the South, Klein said half-jokingly to Richardson. I will prepare it next time, Richardson immediately replied. Klein chuckled and shook his head. No, there's no need. That wouldn't appear decent. Once I'm more familiar with the neighbors and have hosted a daisy styled banquet, we can prepare some sweet iced tea. Haha, <laughs> I believe their children will like it. When Richardson realized that he had mistaken his employer's intentions, he hurriedly said in a fluster, I will keep it in mind. It only took 20 minutes to go from 160 Bachland Street to the St. Samuel Cathedral at Phelps Street on foot. If it wasn't because he needed to hire a coachman and rent a carriage to project an image befitting his status, Klein would rather walk over to digest his food and strengthen his body. Soon, the carriage stopped along the square outside the cathedral. Klein held his gold inlaid cane, got out of the carriage, and stopped there to enjoy the pigeon's dance. After entering the cathedral and coming to the main prayer hall, he passed his top hat and cane to Richardson. He found a seat near the aisle and sat down. He lowered his head, clasped his hands, and seriously and silently prayed. Richardson sat behind him to his side, putting the items in place as he glanced at the dark sacred emblem on the altar. He then closed his eyes. In the serene atmosphere, Klein felt his spirituality lightly scatter. He wasn't too surprised by this, because the praying masses in the cathedral would encounter something similar. The tiny bits of spirituality that carried pious beliefs gathered together to provide power to the Chani's gate seals underground. After an unknown period of time, his spiritual perception triggered as he opened his eyes and looked diagonally across him. Standing there was an elder dressed in a black clergyman robe. His hair was sparse and his face looked pale. He resembled a dead man. From afar, he had a cold aura with a lacking expression. He blended in with the prayer hall's dark environment to a certain extent. The keeper, Klein made a judgment from a single glance. He closed his eyes again and continued praying. Of course, he had already remembered the man's facial features. Big nose, grayish blue eyes, loose facial skin, and no facial hair. The elder dressed as a clergyman had sat down as well. He focused on praying to the goddess. Inside the prayer hall, the wall in front had a few holes. Pure light shone in from them like resplendent stars. It made the dark environment appear gentle and holy. Time ticked by as Klein felt his spiritual perception trigger again. He carefully opened his eyes and saw that the black robed keeper had left his seat and entered a passageway to the side that should lead to the back of the cathedral. The keepers stay inside the cathedral. They have no family and don't have their own residences. From their conditions, it's not that surprising either. Furthermore, the keepers of Chani's Gate are monitored by the bishops, so it's a normal precaution. This means that I have to become friends with the priests and bishops of St. Samuel Cathedral to obtain the freedom to enter the area at the back of the cathedral. Klein didn't sneak any more glances as he closed his eyes and considered various problems. After some time, he slowly got up and walked to the altar. Standing in front of the donation box, he took out 50 pounds in cash and devoutly threw it in. This made the bishop and priest on duty look over. Their gaze turned friendly as they remembered his appearance. After doing that, Klein nodded gently at the clergyman, turned around, and walked down the aisle towards the exit. Richardson held his hat and cane and followed closely behind. Once out the prayer hall, he walked towards the main entrance alongside a series of intricate murals and colored pane windows that lined the top. At this point, a few figures walked in. 
Leading them was a middle-aged man with long sideburns and soft facial features. He wore a black trench coat without any gloves, nor did he carry a cane. Behind him was a young man dressed in a similar trench coat. He had black hair and green eyes, and he looked handsome with his randomly styled hair. He looked like he hadn't combed it after waking up in the morning. Klein was especially familiar with his looks and figure. It felt as though they hadn't seen each other for years. Leonard Mitchell, Klein's pupils constricted a little, but he didn't stop at all. He maintained his pace and stride, and he walked towards the few Nighthawks in black trench coats. Yes, Klein was certain that they were Nighthawks. When they met, he casually swept a gaze at Leonard and company before passing them and walking towards the main entrance. The main entrance was open, and the clouds outside were thin. There was plenty of sunlight and pigeons were flying. Leonard Mitchell glanced at the believers who walked past him out of boredom, and he retracted his gaze. He said with a sigh, I hope we can stay in Backland for a few days this time to have a good rest. The case this time wasn't only dangerous and thrilling, but it also required us to be tense the entire time. His team of red gloves had just cracked a human skin donning devil case, and they had captured two targets. This seemed easy on the surface, but it wasn't simple at all. They went through plenty of setbacks and tribulations before completing the mission with great difficulty. Every member was exhausted both in mind and body. Captain Sos shook his head with a smile. This is the life of us red gloves. You should have known that this would be how it would be back when you chose to join. However, congratulations on advancing to Soul Assurer. Leonard Mitchell curled his lips into a smile. It's slower than I had expected. Also, Captain Sost, you've finally reached Sequence 5. This isn't a problem with the church. If I could have endured it better, I could have become a spirit warlock earlier. Sost wiped his smile away as he walked into the prayer hall's corridor. Pray to the goddess. It will effectively eliminate your mental stress, allowing you to recover. As he spoke, the team of red gloves entered the dark and serene hall as they found a spot to sit down. Leonard was just about to focus on praying when he suddenly heard a slightly aged voice ring in his mind. That person from just now is problematic. Who? Leonard kept his head down as he asked with a suppressed voice. The slightly aged voice replied, One of the men you met at the entrance. I'm living in your body, and my strength hasn't recovered, so I wasn't able to see too clearly. Leonard recalled and asked softly, What do you mean by problematic? He has an ancient aura, a bayonder who has lived for a very long period of time. Leonard mumbled, I will try to investigate. Simultaneously, he thought, old man must be hiding certain things. He seldom volunteers to tell me that someone is problematic, yet be so vague about it. After I find the target and confirm that there's no danger for the time being, I'll leave it. I don't want to be embroiled in the conflict of some undying monsters from the fourth epoch. If that person will really bring about a calamity, I'll directly report it to the archbishop. In an apartment in Sherwood Borough, this the money I borrowed from you. Fris handed 220 pounds to Zio. She had already received the 100 pounds from Mr. Moon and the 500 pounds from Ma'am Hermit. Zio Derecha grabbed at her messy blonde, unsmooth hair, looked at the money, and raised her head to look at Fors. She blurted, You really are involved in illegal gambling. I have to tell you that such gambling must be a scam and a trap. They let you win in order to make you lose more. Even though you're a trick master and have a chance of fooling them, such gambling scams might have other Bayonders hiding in it. Stop, stop, stop. Frizz lowered her hands. She said in bemused anger, Do I look like someone who will participate in illegal gambling? Yes. Zio didn't hesitate in her reply. If I didn't stop you, you wouldn't just be smoking cigarettes, you'd even be smoking cannabis. That's because I needed to numb myself due to the pain brought by the full moon's ravings. I no longer need to. Frizz didn't debate with Zio as she directly explained, I sold the mysticism knowledge I know at a Bayonder gathering. Ha <laughs> ha. That person was very generous and had paid several hundred pounds. Is that so? Zio instantly threw the problem to the back of her mind and said, There's been a new Bayonder gathering that appeared recently in Eastboro. I've been invited. A new Bayonder gathering. Frizz was first taken aback before feeling a sense of anticipation. According to her teacher, Dorian Gray, and Mr. Fool, she knew that Louis Ween was an oracle of the Aurora Order. His arrival in Backland was likely to replace the missing Mr. A, so as to rebuild the Aurora Order faction in this big city. Therefore, there was a solid chance that he had disguised himself to organize a new Bayonder gathering. Frizz thought for a moment and said seemingly mindlessly to Zio, Are you going to join it? Of course, I have to prepare the interrogator formula potion, Zio answered decisively. Frizz nodded and covered her mouth to yawn. Remember to bring me along when you have the privilege of inviting a new member. Chapter 751, Lone-Styled Euphemism 
late at night, 7 Pinster Street. Leonard Mitchell sat on a chair with his legs raised onto the side of his desk. Following that, he leaned back, causing the wooden headrest to creak from the pressure. His breathing gradually turned long and slow. After an unknown period of time, his eyelids drooped and covered his eyes. At this moment, Leonard's spirit had arrived in a gray, hazy world, but he was still in his bedroom. He flew to the window and saw thick gray fog blanket the nearby streets and extend outwards. It seemed to be embracing all of Backland. The street lamps along the streets and the warm light from the different houses appeared abnormally dim. They were only able to illuminate a very tiny region, and everything seemed to be tainted with a sense of blurriness. At the same time, blobs of illusory oval lights appeared as they enveloped a house in an intersecting manner, as though it was the source of their existence. This was the city through a nightmare's eyes. Leonard followed up on his previous investigations and leaped out the window in a nightmare state. He then flew to 17 Minsk Street. He didn't attempt to storm in. He stood at the door in the thick fog as he politely pulled the doorbell. Cuckoo, cuckoo, dressed in her nightgown, Stellan Samer opened the door. She placed her silver inlaid pleated fan at her chest as she asked in confusion and puzzlement, Who are you looking for? She was none other than Klein's landlord back when he was acting as Sherlock Moriarty. She was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed lady in her thirties. Leonard had already changed into a black and white checkered police uniform. He casually showed his identification and asked, Do you know Sherlock Moriarty? Trapped in the dream, Stellan's reaction was very slow. She asked after a few seconds, did something happen to him? Just as she asked, her impression of Sherlock Moriarty appeared beside her under Leonard's influence. He wore a half-top hat, a double-breasted frock coat, gold-rimmed spectacles on his nose, and a bushy mustache around his mouth. This was identical to the information he previously received about Sherlock Moriarty. Hence, he didn't show any doubts and said, he's been involved in a case and is undergoing an investigation. I hope you can cooperate with us. All right. Stellan wished to raise her chin, but for some reason, she felt a little horrified. Leonard thought for a second and asked, Since when did he rent this place from you? Early September last year, Stellan said after recalling her memories. Leonard continued asking, What do you know of him? Or should I say, what kind of person do you think he is? When that was mentioned, Stellan appeared as though she had long considered the answer to such a question. He comes from Midseashire, and he has an accent from that area. He's a very capable detective, and he once exposed the adultery which Mary's husband was undertaking. However, his income isn't too high. He doesn't even hire a full-time housemaid. All he can do is get my maid to help him part-time. My children tell me that he's good at telling stories, especially detective-related stories. This might be why he had chosen this profession. Without giving Leonard a chance to interrupt her, she droned on incessantly. He's not as boorish like the typical detective. He went to grammar school and studied history. What leaves me most envious of all is how he obtained Mary's gratitude. He joined the Quellog Club where its members are people with significant status. I've only been there a few times. Later, he apparently became famous in the detective circles, and private detectives often came to look for him. Leonard lost his patience listening to her drone on as he couldn't help but rub his temples. He had failed to obtain any useful information from Mrs. Stellan. Apart from Sherlock Moriarty's poor financial situation and him being good at telling detective stories, the rest was within the scope of what he had previously investigated. He even knew that Sherlock Moriarty had good ties with Isengard Stanton. Next, I'll investigate those from the Quellog Club who have good relationships with Sherlock Moriarty. Once he patiently finished listening to Mrs. Stellan's droning, he immediately thanked her and left her dream. 160 Bachland Street, inside Dwayne Dante's mansion. In the hall that could accommodate more than a hundred dancers, Klein was embracing a lady in her thirties as they danced. This was the etiquette teacher that Walter had hired. Her name was Wahana Heisen. She had a common name, but she wasn't ordinary at all. Her facial features were only above average, but her disposition was impeccable. Her every action was filled with charm. According to Walter's introduction, she was born in a baron's family. She received a good education from a young age and later entered the palace. She had the job of court lady until she was married. As her family had declined and her husband's financial situation was only ordinary, being a believer in the Evernight goddess prompted her to choose to become a private tutor in etiquette. She often went to the families of nobles and tycoons to teach their children. Although the butler didn't spell it out, Klein knew that he couldn't perform badly in front of this lady, or there was no way to save his reputation. The way members of high society asked about a person's situation was mainly through common acquaintances, and at times, the interaction between servants also mattered. 
With nimble footsteps and graceful moves, the black-haired Wahana nodded approvingly. Mr. Dantes, it's hard for me to imagine you not having learned these dance steps before. In less than half an hour, you're as skilled as a noble who received education on this from a young age. It's all thanks to your teachings. Clang gave a humble smile as he wore a warm, humble look. With the clown's balance, dancing was a very easy matter for him. Wahana lowered her head and chuckled softly. You're a gentleman who can really make a lady happy. She immediately raised her light brown eyes and swept her gaze across Dwayne Dante's silver sideburns and deep blue eyes. That's the best praise I've heard today, Klein replied with a smile. During this period, his feet kept moving as he spun Wahana gently around. Not far away, the hired quartet's melodious music echoed through the hall. He had the intention to have close ties with Wahana not to improve his reputation, but because she was once a court lady. After Wahana corrected a minor mistake that Dwayne Dante's committed, she said, When inviting a lady to dance, it's not only a dance. You also need to converse. You can't be like two dolls unless both of you are so immersed in the dance and music's rhythm that you do not wish to speak. Of course, that's also a form of communication, a form of communication of the heart. When conversing, you must be euphemistic because this is lone, not in tis. To put it simply, do not be direct and crude. You need to appear gentlemanly. Let me raise an example. If you wish to compliment a lady for her perfume, you can't directly tell her how nice it smells, nor ask what kind of perfume it is to praise her. You need to connect a more euphemistic meaning to it and mention that. Yes, you can say something like, it feels like I'm out in the spring meadows. Of course, this needs to match the traits of perfume. There's no literary feel. Shouldn't you say that the moon is beautiful, isn't is? Klein lampooned with a Japanese-styled euphemism as he said with a self-deprecating smile. Thank you for not telling me that my praises weren't gentlemanly enough. Wahana's smile deepened. Mr. Dante's, do you know what kind of gentleman is very welcomed by women at social events? Pray, do tell. Klein honestly shook his head. Wahana said without a change in her smile. The second most popular type are men who make women think that he's very intelligent. What about the first? Klein asked cooperatively. Wahana glanced at him and said, The most popular type are men who make women think that they are very intelligent. Upon saying that, she smiled and didn't say another word. Klein instantly understood she was hiding her praise in between the lines. So this is lone-styled euphemism. It's not like in Tiss where they just aim straight for the lower half of the body. Hum, that's what's written in papers and magazines. I have no way of confirming what real in Tiss social events are like. Anyway, both countries often sully each other. The emperor's era does match that description though. Klein nodded in enlightenment. The two-hour etiquette lesson ended in a harmonious mood. Klein walked teacher Wahana Heisen to the door with butler Walter and valet Richardson before giving her a tiny gift. It was Moonlight, a perfume from the Dream Company. It was mixed with grey amber, making it rather expensive. As for how much it was, Klein wasn't sure, as housekeeper Tanja was responsible for buying it. The payment was through her. Only when the £1,000 was almost expended would she come to him with receipts and a list for him to vet so as to receive fresh funds. The reason why Klein knew the company and perfume was that his butler had informed him ahead of time. It was to prevent him from appearing insincere if Ma'am Wahana were to ask. From this detail, he had a deep understanding of the use of a good butler. Watching the satisfied Ma'am Wahana Heisen leave, Klein held back the urge to rub his temples as he sighed inwardly. This is more tiring than a Bayonder battle. I have to constantly watch my actions and deliberate over my words. I need some rest. At that point, the white-gloved Walter took a step forward and said, Sir, since you wish for your etiquette studies to progress faster, we can move the remaining lessons forward. What lessons? Klein felt a headache. History, international politics, philosophy, music, as well as general knowledge of sports like golf, racing, hunting. Walter answered meticulously. Philosophy? Klein asked in surprise. Walter nodded. It's one of the most common topics discussed in high society. You don't need to have very deep research into it, but you need to know what others are discussing. You need to know that the origins of philosophy stem from Kongsoka, Merdi, and Patterson, and not Emperor Roselle. You need to know that man was born free came from Lumi. When tycoons first enter high society, many of them often make mistakes in such aspects. They're used to attributing certain sentences and philosophical thoughts to Emperor Roselle. Klein felt his headache the more he heard. He forcefully smiled and said, I haven't got any matters to do recently, apart from my afternoon naps and heading to the cathedral. You can arrange the lessons to be at any time. In a dark room, a letter floated up and opened by itself before shaking the piece of paper. In her tiny bonnet, Sharon's figure was outlined. She grasped the letter and seriously read through it. 
She then wrote a reply and set up a ritual to summon Sherlock Moriarty's messenger. During this process, she didn't forget to prepare a gold coin. Soon, Sharon finished the incantation as she watched the candle flame burgeon and be tainted with a gloomy green color. Rionette Tynecare, with the four blonde, red-eyed heads in hand, appeared out of the candlelight and appeared before Sharon. Sharon's eyes constricted as her doll-like face suddenly showed immense emotional fluctuations. She blurted out, Teacher, haven't you already? Chapter 752, Warning 160 Bachland Street In the sunny study, the bookshelves were orderly arranged with a huge collection. At a glance, one appeared as though they had stepped into a private library. Klein sat on a high back chair as he read the newspapers. He discovered that be it the Tussock Times or the Backland Daily Tribune, there was an additional advertisement in a striking spot. It advertised selling 10% of the Backland Bike Company's shares. Mr. Stanton is rather efficient. It's only been a few days, and he has completed the financial checks and evaluation. Klein silently reflected on the matter when his spiritual perception was triggered. He quickly activated his spirit vision and saw Rionette Tynecare walk out of the void. She still held the four blonde, red-eyed heads in her hand, with one of them having a letter in its mouth. It's likely a reply from Miss Sharon. As Klein had these thoughts, he reached out to receive it and nodded. Thank you. As he spoke, he subconsciously glanced at the door because standing outside was his valet, Richardson. After tearing open the envelope and unfolding the letter, Klein quickly scanned it, confirming that it was written by Sharon. She indicated that she had no intention of buying biological poison bottle, and she might only consider it after a period of time if it was still available. She's in a tight financial situation, or is she saving money to do something important? Klein casually thought and instinctively felt that it was the latter. This was because it was impossible for the demigod named Zatwin to keep staying in Backland. For now, Sharon and Merrick had escaped the pursuit of the Rose School of Thought, and with their Bayonder powers and unique traits about their sequences, it wasn't difficult for them to amass money in a relaxed environment. Furthermore, they seemed to be in charge of the illegal arms dealing in the Bravehearts bar, and they were the backers behind Ian. Just this alone would make them plenty of money. As he thought about it, Klein looked up and saw Miss Messenger's eight red eyes looking at him intently. He jumped in fright, imagining that she was urging him to pay the debt he owed her. He cleared his throat and said, There's no need to reply. I'll be paying the first installment within the week. Rionette Tynecare's forehead spoke one after another. There's no rush. There's no interest. Miss Messenger is quite nice after all. As Klein sighed, Rionette Tynecare vanished from her spot, returning back into the depths of the spirit world. After burning the letter and resting for half an hour, he walked to the door to inform Richardson to prepare the carriage. He planned on heading to the cathedral before his philosophy class in the afternoon. The journey there was smooth sailing, and Klein arrived at the square outside St. Samuel Cathedral after a few sips of tea. After gaining the serenity from taking in the sights of the pigeons, he strode towards the cathedral's main door, entered the prayer hall, and randomly found a pew to sit at. Like before, Richardson sat diagonally behind him with his master's hat and cane. As he emptied his mind during his prayers, Klein's spiritual perception was triggered once again. He instinctively opened his eyes and looked left. He saw the black-haired, green-eyed Leonard Mitchell. This Nighthawk wasn't wearing a trench coat. He looked casual with his white shirt tucked out while matching them with straight trousers and a black vest. Seeing the middle-aged man with gray streaks at his sideburns look at him, he smiled with a nod, retracted his gaze, and closed his eyes in a bid to pretend to pray. He wasn't worried that the man would discover that he was watching him because he had only done a cursory sweep without any additional actions. Many believers present had similar actions as well. It was inevitable for a good-looking, dignified gentleman to attract some attention when he entered. Leonard Mitchell was someone who often attracted such attention, so he knew this very well. At this moment, the slightly aged voice sounded in his mind. It's him. Ha. He didn't make my hard work of running over to the cathedral yesterday, and today be in vain. Leonard thought smugly as his expression remained stoic. Klein was also pretending to pray as puzzlement surfaced in his thinking mind. When did this fellow, Leonard, become so pious? Although he's definitely more pious than me, he's not the kind of person who would come to the cathedral every day. He would come once or twice a week at best. What's his goal for coming? He seemed to be observing me just now. Upon having this thought, Klein suddenly realized something. The grandpa in him is the angel of the Zoros family, which makes him an angel of the Marauder Pathway. Blasphemer Ammon is a king of angels of this pathway. He could discover the gray fog and even try to infiltrate it. So, it's very possible that the grandpa and Leonard can also sense the gray fog or the traces of its powers on me. 
Upon making this judgment, Klein immediately felt his heart in his throat. He felt like dangerous traps were surrounding him. He maintained his praying posture, and the eyes under his eyelids remained motionless. His entire person was calm and reserved, completely identical to the cathedral's atmosphere. After an unknown period of time, he slowly got up and walked to the altar. He came before the donation box and threw in a total of 50 pounds in cash. Following that, he did the same as before, smiling at the bishop and priest on duty while nodding. He received a rather friendly response. The moment he walked out of St. Samuel Cathedral, Klein received his hat from Richardson, and he fed the pigeons on the square for about 10 minutes. And behind him, the believers who had finished their prayers walked out, including Leonard Mitchell. Without looking at the entrance, Klein leisurely clapped his hands, took his gold inlaid cane, and walked to the nearby four-wheeled carriage. Leonard was similarly feeding the pigeons on the square, but he didn't have any intention of following when he saw his target leave on the carriage. Since the person had an ancient aura and that the parasite in him placed such importance on him, he obviously didn't dare to be careless. He didn't act directly, as it was extremely dangerous. He planned on making superficial investigations to gather the required intelligence. I'll see what old man has to say when the time comes. Besides, it's not like there's no direction for investigation at the moment. There can't be that many of that particular type of high-end carriage in Backland. No matter if it's his or if it's rented, it's easy to determine the source. Then, I'll know the identity and background of that gentleman. Leonard glanced at the pigeons as he thought leisurely. He was an experienced nighthawk, and he was even an elite red glove among the nighthawks. At this moment, a pigeon spread its wings and flew over. In its beak there appeared to be a paper slip. Leonard frowned as he reached out his left palm and saw the pigeon fly down before dropping the slip. Then, it flapped its wings and flew off. Raising the paper slip, Leonard warily unfolded it while feeling puzzled. He saw two lines of text on it. Zorost, parasite, this, Leonard's pupils suddenly constricted as he felt all his hair stand up. His emotions nearly exploded at that very instant. That gentleman has seen through my secret. As expected of someone with an ancient aura, he might be one of the undying monsters that remained from the fourth epoch. He's warning me that I shouldn't involve myself in his matters or even come close to him. At that moment, Leonard felt that every action the middle-aged man with white sideburns and blue eyes had done had left him shocked when he recalled them. He was someone not to be looked at directly or approached. He immediately lost all thoughts of investigating the man. As he watched the pigeons land, he said with a suppressed voice, Old man, he might be an old friend of yours. If you wish to investigate, then it's best that you wait till your strength recovers. Old friend, the slightly aged voice repeated the two words as though he found it suspect but couldn't be certain. Leonard quickly converged his emotions and chuckled. So you're someone from the Zoros family. At this moment, about a hundred meters away, at the intersection of Phelps Street and the other streets, the black-haired Duane Dantes who had streaks of gray hair leaned onto the wall as he slowly closed his eyes, hiding his wrinkled facial features in the shadows of the carriage. To the side of his valet, Richardson, a middle-aged man wearing a dark red coat and old triangular hat appeared, bowing to his master before disappearing. No one saw this illusory figure. The carriage slowly turned as a flock of pigeons flew up from the square. After returning home and entering the room with the huge balcony, the silent Klein finally heaved a silent sigh of relief. If Leonard didn't accept the warning because of the grandpa's bewitchment, he planned on writing another slip with the contents, I know where Blasphemer Ammon is. In between the lines, it means I'll tell Blasphemer Ammon that there's a Zorost family angel here if you foil my plans. This wouldn't make the grandpa believe that Duane Dantes was so weak that he had to rely on others to fend him off. It was more of a friendly warning that wouldn't number beyond three times, a form of respect towards an angel. If two warnings weren't enough to rein him in, there was no other choice but to inform Blasphemer Ammon. Yes, there's a very high chance that this would scare them. There must be other ploys or difficulties for this grandpa to choose to parasitize in such a shallow manner. He likely doesn't wish for me to flip the table. Hehe, <laughs> this matter is all thanks to Erodes. If he hadn't informed me ahead of time that Leonard has a marauder angel, I definitely wouldn't have noticed that I've been targeted, much less have the suitable excuse and method to warn them. Klein thought calmly and didn't show the anxiety or flustered state from before. As he relaxed, there was a knock on the door. His valet, Richardson, said, Sir, the butler wishes to seek an audience with you. Please invite him in. Klein left the balcony and returned to the half-open room. The white-gloved Walter entered and said, Sir, your philosophy teacher, Mr. Hamid, is here. Philosophy classes. Klein rubbed his aching temples. He had previously heard from Walter that Mr. Hummy was a believer of the Lord of Storms. It was the same for the famous scholar, Lumi, as well. 
many of the philosophers in the lone kingdom shared the same faith. This made him rather surprised because, to him, believers in the storm were irascible bros. From the looks of it, I have to change my stereotypes and subjective impressions. Heh. The prerequisite to being a philosopher is to not have a wife or not have a causal relationship with their families. As Klein lampooned, he straightened his clothes and walked to the door. He said to Butler Walter, All right, I'll head over there now. Chapter 753 Bishop Visits After the philosophy class, Klein had a feeling as though he hadn't slept in three days. His mind was filled with names and concepts like skepticism, metaphysics, a priori and a posteriori, nominalism, Roselle socialism, existentialism, and positivism. If it wasn't because the original Klein had studied history, which included some mastery of philosophy, he doubted that he had the ability to last through the lesson. This wasn't his college lessons on earth, they were one-to-one, -one, making it impossible for him to sleep, daydream, or read novels on his cell phone when he didn't understand the content. Actually, Mr. Hamid was quite different from what I had imagined. He was humorous, candid, and extroverted. His lesson wasn't dull, making him unlike a philosophy teacher. He also doesn't possess the stereotypes of a Lord of Storms believer. Klein rubbed his temples, turned to leave, and walked to the staircase. He returned to the third floor as his valet, Richardson, followed him in silence. During this process, he discovered that his servants were busy with their own duties. None of them were lazing about, and they would only stop when their employer walked past. They would bow and greet him, clearly indicating how well-mannered they were. Tanja is very capable when it comes to the arrangement and management of household matters after all. Klein walked through the corridor on the third floor and walked to the half-open room. Before he walked in, Klein saw Butler Walter hanging two double-barreled hunting rifles on the wall, making the interior have a raw and bold feeling. This was a decoration every tycoon's home had. It's very easy to get approved for a hunting license. A double-barreled hunting rifle is potent, enough to allow the servants to fend off any criminals who wish to burgle or kidnap me. After hanging the rifle up, Walter took two steps back and observed the hunting rifle. He then took out a golden pocket watch from his inner pocket. Pa, he opened the pocket watch and looked at the lid's interior. His stern, old-fashioned face softened significantly. Klein coughed gently to inform his butler before pushing open the ajar door and walked in. Walter closed the pocket watch, returned to his spot, and bowed. Sir, we applied for six hunting licenses and bought six double-barreled hunting rifles and the corresponding canister cartridges. Klein had death knell hiding under his armpit, so he didn't mind it too much. All he did was nod as a form of acknowledgement. He then revealed a warm smile and asked as though having a casual chat. Back when I saw the information from the Family Servant Assistance Association, I noticed that you already have a wife and child. A butler was the assistant to the employer. He was a confidant that knew many matters, therefore, establishing rapport with the butler was something every employer had to do. Klein didn't wish to be an exception. Furthermore, he remembered Arrow's mentioning that Butler Walter could result in additional developments. Walter answered in all seriousness, Yes, back when I was a servant at the Viscount Conrad's manor, I had to have constant contact with a lady due to work. We began having feelings for each other, and under the goddess's watch, we walked down the aisle of marriage and ended up having a daughter. She's currently studying at a grammar school and wishes to pass the Backlund University's entrance exams. However, that's something to consider only two years later. Upon mentioning his wife and daughter, this unsmiling butler's tone unknowingly turned mellow. At present, all the churches were emphasizing the importance of family. It was to stem the stress and mental problems that arose due to the tide of technological progress. The only difference was that different churches emphasized different matters. For Evernight, men and women were equal as they helped one another in the family. For Storm, men were to work outside while women were to handle the family to be the former's supportive angel. For Steam, it was more about learning more and to have technology do more of the work. All of them had their strengths, and they complemented each other. Klein felt wistful hearing that as he said, Ma'am Tanja seems to be single. Yes, Walter's expression turned solemn again. In modern society, male and female servants still do not enjoy equal treatment. I'm not referring to the salary, as a housekeeper is at the same level as a butler or butler assistant, earning 25 to 50 pounds a year. Instead, I'm talking about a deeper idea and belief. The church is trying to change it, but there's plenty of resistance. After all, the goddess isn't the only belief in loan. 
He paused and added, male servants can get married, but if a female servant were to have a family, it implies the loss of her job or becoming the lowest laundress who's only a part-time employee that doesn't need to live at the employer's residence. All of these will change only when one reaches the rank of housekeeper. But this isn't something a young and inexperienced lady is qualified for. Klein didn't continue on the topic as he nodded gently. He then walked towards the reclining chair. At this moment, his gaze swept by the piled newspaper by the coffee table. His mind stirred as he paused, turned to the side and said to his butler, I saw an advertisement on the papers regarding the sale of Backland Bike Company shares. Find a professional lawyer and accountant to inquire about it to figure out the exact situation. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm rather interested in this industry. If the price is right, I'll consider buying it. For a second, Klein thought of a problem. As a tycoon who had brought huge sums of money to Backland to seek out better opportunities, it was impossible that he didn't pay attention to the sale of the Backland by company shares. Since he didn't know the prospects of this industry, he needed to hire people to gain a better understanding of it. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit his persona. Of course, I can also raise the price as a result, allowing me to sell those 10% shares at a higher price. Yes, I have to remember to just raise the price a little and not be too greedy. If I were to keep raising the price and it ends up back in my hands, I'll be crying. It would throw all my liquidity into it, and I won't be able to maintain my daily expenses. As Klein fantasized, he warned himself. Yes, sir. Walter didn't ask further as he directly agreed. At 4.35 p.m., Richardson knocked on the door and entered. He said to Dwayne Dantes, who was reading leisurely, Sir, Mr. Maury Macht and his wife, Ma'am Rihanna, as well as St. Samuel Cathedral's Bishop Electra, is here to pay you a visit. Maury Macht, that House of Commons Member of Parliament. Also, why would St. Samuel Cathedral's Bishop be here as well? Klein thought and asked with a smile, Is there such a protocol? He had only attended two etiquette lessons and knew that at his stage, visits wouldn't be that direct. People would first send their butlers or servants to hand over an invitation or schedule a visit. Richardson habitually lowered his head and said, Yes, it's because Mr. Butler informed the neighbors that you would be home in the afternoon for the next week when he was delivering your name cards and gifts. Under such a situation, neighbors who received your name card and have heard about you will observe the corresponding details. Not only can they send their servants to invite you over, but they can also pass by on the excuse of being out on an afternoon stroll from 4 to 5 to make a semi-formal visit. Oh, the ladies will wear strolling attire, otherwise, it wouldn't be decent enough. And you can also invite them to have afternoon tea with you. Klein walked to the door and allowed Richardson to retrieve his coat to help him wear it. He then asked, then why would Bishop Electra be here as well? This was what he really cared about most. The first question was to lead up to it. Richardson answered as though he had prepared an answer. Bishop Electra was a guest at Member of Parliament Mac's house in the afternoon. They must have mentioned you while having a chat and decided to pay a visit by strolling over. His hands weren't affected by his talking. He skillfully helped Dwayne Dantes adjust his attire. Klein tersely acknowledged, and after Richardson went forward to open the door, he walked out. Soon, he saw the three visitors in a small living room on the second floor. Maury Macht was a classic Lonese gentleman. He was in his forties, and he had black hair and brown eyes. He had a deep outline with a receding hairline. His face was a little thin and long. He was formerly in the military and had entered politics after being discharged. He started his career in Backland until he became a member of Parliament of the Kingdom's House of Commons. He was a believer of the Evernight Goddess and a member of the New Party. He was in support of improving the environment. His wife, Rihanna, was from a family of lawyers. She provided plenty of funding for her husband's political ambitions, and she was also a believer of the Evernight Goddess. Electra wore a black, double-breasted clergyman's robe. He looked to be 40, and he had deep, blue eyes and a thin face. He wasn't good-looking, but for some baffling reason, he was pleasing to the eyes. Klein had once met this bishop when he was donating money into the donation box. Upon seeing Dwayne Dantes appear, Maury Mack took two steps forward and chuckled. I've been hearing for the past few days that a pious believer in the goddess had moved into Unit 160, and I've been wanting to visit. We happened to be taking a stroll today, and we took the liberty to visit. Please pardon us for our faux pas. Klein smiled and tapped his chest four times in a clockwise fashion. At such times, the only thing we need to do is praise the lady. Praise the lady. Electra and Rihanna nodded as they drew a crimson moon on their chests. After exchanging pleasantries, Klein invited his three guests to take a seat. A maid hurriedly delivered some tea and coffee. Housekeeper Tanja had already asked each one of them what they wanted prior. 
Mr. Dantes, I heard you're a merchant from Daisy. I wonder what business you were previously engaged in. Maury Mack asked casually before joking. Your last name just makes me think of many things. He was referring to the protagonist's name of a particular best-selling novel written by Emperor Roselle. Klein smiled and humorously asked in return. What kind of business does digging up treasure count as? This was also related to the content of said best-selling novel. Without waiting for the member of parliament to answer him, he said the answer he had long fabricated. I once had my own mine, but as you know, it will one day be mined out. Mining cities would also end up waning as a result. He was hinting that he was born in one of the resource-rich cities in Dacey County. There, gangs were rampant, and there were many secret tycoons. If ordinary people were to attempt to investigate Duane Dantes's situation, it would take them at least half a year. Bishop Electra nodded and thought as he asked, So, you chose to come to Backland to seek out new opportunities. May I know who proselytized you into the church? Chapter 754 Invitation Klein had already walked through Bishop Electra's last question before, so he said with a sigh, It was my father. He was a truly wise elder. Unfortunately, he passed away many years ago during an accident. When he said that, he infused the original Klein's emotions of losing his parents, him being in an alternate world with no home to return to, as well as the scars that resulted from his time in Tingen City. He sounded calm and wore a slight smile, but there was a sorrow that lasted forever that remained hidden deep inside. And sorry for your loss. He must have entered the holy residence of the goddess, sleeping peacefully under her watch. Bishop Electra answered sincerely as he formed the sign of the crimson moon on his chest. Without waiting for Duane Dantes to respond, he looked at him and invited him. There will be a moon mass the day after tomorrow for the deceased. It will help him sleep in the goddess's nation and receive eternal peace. I wonder if you're interested in participating. The Church of the Evernight Goddess didn't have many festivals, and the most important one was Winter Gifts Day. The second most important was the Mass held during the full moon, also known as the Moon Mass. The rest were just normal Masses and prayers on weekends. However, different dioceses and different cathedrals had their own patron saints and angels which would have a corresponding special festival for them. I would love to. Klein stood up and bowed, saying it from the bottom of his heart. This gave him the perfect excuse to interact with the bishops and priests of St. Samuel Cathedral, or even the diocese bishop. He had a firm foundation for entering particular regions in the cathedral. Meanwhile, he came to realize why the Evernight pathway was interchangeable with the death pathway. Both wielded the authorities of serenity, eternal sleep, and darkness. It represented the end and a destination. Following that, Maury Mack didn't continue the topic regarding Duane Dantes's identity and background. It appeared as though he had only been asking and passing. He and his wife, Rihanna, began idly talking about their vacation experience in Daisy Bay last year. Having filled the gaps on this by staying there for two days, Klein replied with a native tone as he shared his thoughts on the Daisy specialty, roasted fish. During this process, he also pretended to unintentionally mention his hunting activities while he was doing business in West Balaam, and how he was extremely familiar with the primitive forest over there. This was to build up the necessary foundations for the second layer to Duane Dantes's identity. Furthermore, West Balaam was different from East Balaam. The colonial factions from Lone and Intis were on par, allowing for frequent conflicts. Even the actively controlled regions would experience changes from time to time. To investigate the activity trajectories of a merchant or adventurer wasn't easy at all. This was even more so the case when Duane Dantes was likely using a fake name. As for his hunting experience in West Balaam's primitive forest, Klein didn't randomly fabricate stories, nor did he plagiarize articles from the magazines or newspapers. He used what the fog sees strongest hunter, Anderson, had previously mentioned regarding his glorious deeds as a blueprint. He drew on the details and abandoned the main storyline. What he fabricated was partially true and fake as well. Upon hearing the thick anacondas, man-eating fishes, and flowers which could capture their own prey in the forest, Rihanna would let out gasps from time to time, looking afraid but also eager to know more. As for the member of parliament and bishop, they were equally interested. They often had to force themselves to interrupt Duane Dantes's description to ask about the details. You really are an excellent hunter. Back when I was serving in East Balaam, I never had the chance to enter the forest. I never expected it to be this dangerous. After this extremely dignified middle-aged gentleman finished his tales, Maury Mack picked up a tiny piece of velvet cake and praised sincerely. I wish to invite you to go hunting if there's a chance in the future. As they conversed, a maid had delivered the afternoon tea pastries. A male servant served them from the side. 
upon hearing Member of Parliament Mack's semi-serious invitation, Klein replied with a smile, I'm already looking forward to it. After chatting a little more and discussing Backland's pollution control, the three guests suggested they take their leave. As they had only acquainted themselves and weren't considered familiar with each other, Klein didn't retain them. He sent them to the door with his valet, Richardson. As he watched the bishop, member of parliament and his wife leave, Klein's smile slowly disappeared until there was nothing left. He was rather pleased with the progress he had made. Bishop Electra was directly related to the Church of the Evernight Goddess, which was the main goal for him to return to Backland. Maury Macht was a discharged soldier and a member of parliament at present. Without a doubt, he belonged to certain military officer clubs, and he would be beneficial to his continued investigation of the great smog of Backland. Next up, I should slowly deepen our relationships. Klein returned to the small living room and saw that the maid had taken away the remaining pastries and tea. He originally planned on having a little more. As for the cook which Dwayne Dantes had hired, he was skilled in that. Even Mamriana was filled with praise about it. Klein also agreed from the bottom of his heart. Retracting his gaze, Klein didn't say a word as he steadily walked to the staircase that led to the third floor. Before dinner, Butler Walter finally returned to the house and briefed him on the situation regarding the 10% of Backland Bike Company's shares. Sir, we are lucky enough. Someone had hired a professional lawyer and accountant to investigate the situation of the Backland Bike Company and they had offered a price to the seller before the advertisements were published. But in subsequent negotiations, the price exceeded the buyer's expectations. He had no choice but to give up. This way, we don't have to wait for the investigation report. We can directly hire that original team. Klein nodded and asked without hiding anything. What's the current bid? The buyer that gave up had offered £6,000 with a bottom-line price of £7,000. The seller didn't divulge the situation about the other buyer, However, from the feedback from various channels, it's at least 8,000 pounds. 8,000 pounds. Not too bad. Should I raise it a little more? If I were to raise the price a little and the other party just gives up, wouldn't it be awkward? Klein nodded slightly and said, give me the corresponding report. I'll consider it. After flipping through the report and having dinner to accentuate his extravagant but brilliant image as someone who did solid work, Klein turned his head to Richardson and said, prepare the two-wheel carriage. I'll be making a trip outside. He originally imagined that Richardson would ask him in surprise. A two-wheeled carriage didn't seem befitting enough, but to his surprise, his valet answered politely after flashing a curious look, all right, sir, submissive and never asking why. That's also considered an advantage. Klein sighed inwardly as he waited for Richardson to return to help him wear his coat. After getting on the two-wheeled carriage, he directly instructed, let's circle around the Backland Bridge area and East Borough. Richardson still didn't ask about his master's motives and just got the coachman to steer the horses carefully. As the carriage passed through Sherwood Borough, it arrived in the Backland Bridge area under the illumination of the street lamps. Klein didn't give a destination, and he only got the coachman to meander through the nearby streets. He leaned against the carriage wall, looking out at the streets. He saw pedestrians in old clothes, walking along with tired faces as though they were in a rush to return home for dinner after a hard day's work. Occasionally, there would be the ringing of a bike passing by. They were fast as they shot into the distance. In comparison, the rider's expression appeared more lively than the pedestrians. They seemed to beam with an indescribable sense of pride. It's an obvious difference in class, although it's the difference between a technical worker and an ordinary worker, with the difference in weekly salaries of one to two pounds to those with one pound a week. Klein slowly exhaled as he subconsciously looked up at the sky. At that moment, darkness had already completely covered Backland's skies, but the smog wasn't too serious. One could see through them and see the twinkling stars. After the great smog, the management of the environment is improving by the day. However, the situation with the lower-class workers in the East Borough hasn't significantly improved. Although their salaries might be higher, and their working hours have improved, due to the large number of people surging in, prices have risen across the board, reducing the effects of the salary hike. The improvement in working hours have just gone from 15, 16 hours to 11, 12 hours. They're just fixing the problems with the greatest problems. As for the other problems that didn't rear their ugly heads, they're neglected. 
Yes, the kingdom is still undergoing reforms. Many things haven't been straightened out. Klein watched as his thoughts drifted until the carriage left Sherwood Burrow. On the future, Admiral of Stars Catalia stood behind the windows in the captain's cabin, watching Frank Lee pushing wooden barrels into the shadows. He was putting unknown things into it before closing the lid. He's recently been researching the growth of plants in dark environments. Why did he suddenly become normal? Catalia frowned with suspicion, often worrying that Frank Lee would create some huge invention. I'll get Nina to ask later. Just as she had this thought, her spiritual perception was triggered. She turned her head to see a letter on her desk. As a faint smile curled on her lips without her realizing it, Catalia walked over, tore open the envelope, and unfolded the letter. She quickly read through it. There are two obnisks that do not belong to the Church of Storms swimming north from Sonia Island towards the Abyss Maelstrom. Find the direct descendant of Abraham family. You did well. Abyss Maelstrom was the name of a dangerous area at sea and not the Abyss. Abraham family. Catalia thought for a moment, and without any clues, she planned on asking at the next tarot gathering. The next morning, after divining again if he should raise the price again, Klein said to Butler Walter, hire that team and continue the negotiation. My bottom line is 9,000 pounds. All right, sir. Walter then immediately said with an apologetic look, something happened at home, and I wish to have half a day off. No problem. Do you need any help? Klein asked gently. Thank you for asking. I can handle it, and it's not too urgent. I will first handle the matters regarding the share negotiation first, Walter said sincerely. Klein didn't ask further as he nodded and permitted him to take time off. After his butler left the room, Klein turned to look at Richardson and asked, Did Walter meet anyone earlier this morning? Mr. Butler received a letter, Richardson replied without hiding anything. 